Hello, everyone. I want to welcome everyone to the COVID-19 vaccines and people with disabilities in Ontario. My name is John Massa, and I work for the Center for Independent Living in Toronto. I am the Independent Living Skills Coordinator. And to describe myself, I have very short black hair, a uh, short black mustache. Um, I am a person with a physical disability with chronic care needs. And I use the pronouns of he and him. And I'm joined by the presenter today, Tim Valier, as well as my colleagues, Rebecca Wood, Rayhan Hussein, David Myers, and Lisa Devon. So, although this webinar is happening virtually, so would like to begin by acknowledging the land on which we gather is the territory of the Haudenosaunee and most recently, the territory of the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Ojibwe and the Allied Nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. This territory is also covered by the Upper Canada Treaties. Today, the meeting place of Toronto is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community on this territory. Before I move ahead, I just want to make sure I'm going at a good pace for the TEP interpreters and the captioner, and that, Rehan, that we're capturing the video and the captioning. John, just on the video, everything is going fine. And captioning? I see the captioning, so it is it is working as well. And the interpreters were good? The interpreters are good. Thank you, John. Thank you. So some workshop guidelines. Uh, we have ASL interpreters who are uh, assisting the deaf interpreters who are on screen and they will be rotating um, the deaf interpreters. And we have captioning for this webinar. If you need support, uh, please select Rebecca in the chat box or email her at Rebecca, R-E-B-E-C-C-A dot wood, W-O-O-D at C-I-L-T dot C-A and she will assist you. We will be recording the Zoom webinar and the questions and answers section so it can be shared with people with disabilities and our allies. The workshop is content heavy, but meant to empower you with information and resources. For privacy and time management, everyone will be muted and no video except for the hosts and the interpreters. If you have a specific question or comment for the facilitators, please type it in the chat box or email Rebecca at rebecca.wood at cilt.ca. And she will ask if you're in questions and answer section. Your question and comment will be anonymous in the final recording. And we want to co-create a space that everyone will feel heard and respected. However, we reserve the right to remove anyone from the webinar who does not follow the guidelines. 
Oops. One second. So uh, the agenda, we have done the welcome land acknowledgement introductions um, and went through the guidelines. We'll go through the workshop objectives, which is about 60 minutes. Questions and answers will hopefully be 40 minutes. And finally, resources, evaluations, and thank yous uh, will take about 10 minutes. For a workshop disclaimer, this webinar is for general information purposes only and is not meant to be a substitute for advice provided by a provided by a doctor or a qualified health care professional. People should always consult with their doctor or other health care professionals for medical advice or information about COVID-19 vaccines. As um, things are changing rapidly, this information is current as of April 2nd, 2021, or where otherwise stated. The information is information given is subject to change depending on possible policy, regulation, mm -hmm. and law changes in Ontario. For the most current information, participants should check government of Ontario websites and other websites mentioned in this presentation. This presentation is the property of Timothy Valier, RPN and owner of Integrity Care Consultants, and neither whole or part is to be circulated without his express consent. His contact number is 905-895-0842, and this workshop is based on Canada and Ontario vaccine rollout. So the workshop objectives today, first is information on the development process of COVID-19 vaccines, effectiveness and safety in Canada. The second objective is um, how Canada chose groups for early vaccination. The third objective is information on the different COVID vaccines. The fourth objective is addressing vaccine hesitancy and the meaning of herd immunity. The fifth objective is the vaccine rollout and getting a vaccine in Ontario. The sixth objective is vaccine advocacy and equity. The seventh objective is resources. And then finally, questions and answers. So a little bit about the center for independent living in Toronto. We're rooted in the nothing about us without us disability rights movement. SILP is a community-based resource center run by people with disabilities or people with disabilities. And we work toward a society where people with disabilities have social and economic equity. We have co we have core programs and they are information and referral and a volunteer program. We have peer support and parenting with a disability network. My program, which is independent living skills training, a tenant service application center and the direct funding program. SILT believes in the independent living philosophy where people with disabilities are seen as consumers who have the right to examine choices, make decisions, take risks, make mistakes, and take responsibility for one's own life. Um, so our presenter today is Timothy Valier. He is an RPN who began his healthcare career in 1979. He's a healthcare educator. He's a president of Integrity Care Consultants, specializing in care and services for physically disabled adults and seniors, operational reviews, education development, sales and marketing, and workshop facilitation, both provincially and internationally. He is also an educator uh, at York Region District School Board for personal support worker program development, T 
teacher and clinical preceptor. And he's an RPN at Emily House and Philippa Z, Philippa Z Center, a pediatric uh, hospice. So I'll pass it on to Tim for objective one. Hi guys, welcome. Thanks for sharing your time with me today. Um, we're going to watch a video that's going to sort of describe um, uh, some really relevant information in just a bit. But at first I wanna just talk about what a vaccine and how a vaccine helps us. So there's sort of three words that I want us to remember. The first word is antigen. And an antigen can be considered a disease. Okay, so antigen equals a disease, something we don't want in our body. An antibody is something that our immune system produces to fight that antigen. So it wants to get rid of the antigen. So if we think of COVID-19, that's the antigen and our body's ability to create an antibody requires a vaccine. And that's what was the important part. There are two different uh, types of vaccines that we're going to talk about today. And there are four that are approved in use in Canada. There's only three currently being used. So one of those is, a, is called a viral vector type of vaccine. And we'll get into details in a subsequent slide. That viral vector takes an inactive part of of the actual uh, antigen, so it can't harm you. And they create a vaccine that when you get it, helps your immune system to create antibodies. So once you have that vaccine, your body recognizes if COVID-19 tries to make you sick. So that's called a viral vector vaccine. And an mRNA, Vaccine works differently in that they take a protein and our body uses proteins all the time. It's what keeps our, our cells uh, healthy and working. We have over 10,000 proteins in our body at all times. And an mRNA vaccine takes a protein that um, helps us to, to fight um, that same type of, of, of antigen by creating an antibody with the protein that could invade us. Next slide. So if we think about um, vaccines and effectiveness and safety in Canada, let's look at things like measles. So measles, for example, you get an injection. The antigen is measles. Measles tries to infect your body. Your body recognizes it because you took a vaccine and hopefully you don't get sick. If you do get sick, it's a lessened amount of sickness because you took the vaccine. So you won't get as sick. No vaccine is 100 per percent. There are different types of vaccines that we get. Chickenpox is another one to help us protect us against varicella. The flu shot, the World Health Organization every year looks at what's going on in the community, what happened last year, what's happening right now. And they create a flu vaccine based on what's going on in your specific country area specifically. And then a new pathogen like COVID-19 hits us in a pandemic and we don't have any antibody because we don't have a vaccine. So we need a vaccine and we need it quickly in order to reduce the threat of a pandemic infecting so many people. And we all know the statistics that we've seen recently. Next slide. So we're going to watch a vaccine that's gonna describe the next couple of slides. A video, sorry, I think I said vaccine. John, I can't hear the video. Can other people? John, it could be that I muted you. So if you have not shared your computer audio, you just need to unmute yourself when you hit play.
Can people hear me? Yep. Okay, so I'm going to try it again. Vaccines are the most effective way to prevent the spread of infectious disease, but developing one can be costly, long, and complex. However, with significant investment and collaboration at a global scale, developing a vaccine is possible in a much shorter period of time. So how are vaccines developed today? And will the development of a COVID-19 vaccine be different? All vaccines go through three basic stages of development. The exploratory stage, the preclinical stage, and the clinical stage. In the exploratory stage, scientists do basic laboratory research to find vaccines that can help us develop immunity to a disease before being exposed to it. On January 11, 2020, the genetic code of the virus causing COVID-19 was published. This allowed scientists all over the world to start working on finding potential vaccines. With more than 150 in development worldwide, scientists are using current approaches like using whole or parts of killed or weakened virus and newer techniques such as delivering COVID genetic material directly into cells. In the preclinical stage, scientists use laboratory and animal studies to identify safety concerns before testing the vaccine in humans. It is also used to help find the safest dose. While many vaccine candidates don't progress beyond this point, successful ones move on to the clinical stage, where they are first tested in humans. This stage normally consists of three phases. Phase 1 trials involve a small number of healthy volunteers to test safety and confirm that the vaccine causes an immune response. An immune response refers to how our bodies recognizes and defends itself from viruses and other potentially harmful substances. Promising vaccines then progress to phase two, where they're given to hundreds of participants, including groups at risk of the disease. The goal of phase two is to test the vaccine's safety to propose doses and method of delivery, and again, to assess the immune response. Phase three studies involve thousands of volunteer participants and compare groups that received the vaccines to those that didn't. These studies are used to further answer whether the vaccine works and still demonstrate that it's safe for use. One way scientists have worked to reduce the time to develop a COVID vaccine has been to use study designs that allow merging of clinical phases. For example, new approaches have allowed for phase two participants to be included in larger phase three studies, allowing scientists to shorten the overall timeline and number of participants needed without cutting corners or compromising safety. The first COVID-19 vaccine trials in humans started in March of 2020. Since then, tens of thousands of volunteers have been enrolled in clinical studies worldwide. Health Canada, responsible for regulating the use of vaccines in Canada, has authorized clinical trials for COVID-19 vaccines. Before approving a new vaccine, they look closely at all the data on it, paying very close attention to its safety. Many vaccines will fail somewhere along this path if they don't work or are unsafe. It's normal, and this is the purpose of all the stages of development and clinical trials. Only those that are proven safe, effective, and of high quality will be approved for use in Canada. A safe and effective vaccine will bring us one step closer to the widespread and long-term management of COVID-19. Visit canada.ca from slash coronavirus to learn more. Stop sharing that and I'll reshare the PowerPoint. So the information, thanks John. So the information that you just saw in the video is described on the next couple of slides. So I won't go through the detail. It's just meant to demonstrate that we have safely done all of the research in a timely fashion based on a collaborative global approach. Next slide. Next slide. So there's also another organization which is at arm's length um, to public health and it's called the National Advisory Committee on Immunization. The short form is NACI, N-A-C-I is the short form. They look at the safety and efficacy and they provide information that is public. So you can look, um, the most recent is March 16th that I was able to gather, uh, including today. They did do an update March 29th on the AstraZeneca 
um, vaccine around the blood clotting or bleeding issue. So you free to go to that website and keep yourself up to date. It's a public website. Next. So how did Canada choose their vaccine groups? They looked at biological factors like advanced age, so our senior population. So we know long-term care homes were hit hard. So those were the target group. Those with pre-existing medical conditions, social economic factors um, like low socioeconomic status belonging to a racialized population. Next slide. The decision making, as in all things in healthcare, looks at pillars. And those things are ethics, equity, feasibility, and acceptability. So ethics is what is morally right or wrong. Equity means that we all have equal access. And what we have to remember with the word equity is that there are, are, are large groups of people wanting the vaccination. To make it equitable, we have to have a distribution that looks at all of the factors. So it's really important when you think of equity that we think of it as a stepping stone of priorities based on the factors that we talked about. What we wanna do is make sure that we provide the essential workers, because without essential workers, we can't ensure safety of care to individuals, and that we take risks to protect our general public. And that will look different depending on where you live. Population-based analysis looks at what is the risk of exposure? So when we look at the East Coast, for example, we see it's much less than it is here in York Region, Toronto, the GTA. What is the risk of exposure? Can you physically distance? Do you have access to other measures to help uh, prevent you from infection? The risk of severe illness um, to individuals and how safe and effective those authorized vaccines can get to those key populations. The results of those clinical trials shows that the is impacted by the available vaccine types. So we have four only three are in use right now that we're gonna to get to, and the doses that each group needs. So the current pandemic impacts greatly on how we get those vaccines available to us. As we see, if you watch your local news or go on your local public health, you will see that the timelines are actually moving forward, which is nice to see. They're not as elongated as they originally projected. But remember, every province and every territory can and will adjust based on their local trends and the transmission rates that they have. The priorities is like an upside down triangle. So if we think of a triangle upside down, what we wanna think about is Ministry of Health at that federal level sets who's going to get what. The priority communities are by the provincial public health offices. So in Ontario, we have 34 of those. So there are 34 individual public health offices that then look at what is the risk for their specific area. And as we know, Peel and Toronto are high risk. So when we look at the approved vaccines from the covid19ontario.ca vaccine website, AstraZeneca, which is also Covishield, is expected to be 64% effective after two doses. So what that means in any vaccine we're talking about is 64% in a reduction of an adverse or serious outcome, meaning severe illness, hospitalization, and or death. Janssen, which is expected to be effective at 66% after one dose, still um, is not being used yet in Canada, but it is approved. Moderna and Pfizer, are both 94 and 95% after the two doses. Next. I hope I'm not going too fast. I'm just really mindful of the time. So please interrupt me interpreters if I am going too quickly. So as I said in the beginning, there are two types of vaccines. One's a viral vector and one's an mRNA vaccine. So viral vector, which is AstraZeneca, is where we take the, the actual part of um, that actual antigen in a protein um, that is deactivated, so it can't make you sick. 
and um, an adenovirus, for example, um, is, is a delivery system that they use. And that's what causes us to get a common cold. Once you get that vaccine, it tells your immune system, hey, I need to recognize when this antigen, COVID, tries to get in my body so my immune system can fight it. And it's all based on those proteins that we talked about. So through this process, your immune system is strong, but we also have to look after our immune systems. We have to eat properly, we have to drink properly, we have to exercise, we have to rest, we have to de-stress, and we have to follow the public health guidelines, even when you're vaccinated. So viral vector is AstraZeneca. It's given in two separate injections. It's 0.5 mils, so it's a very tiny amount of injection. A teaspoon is five mils to give you a comparison. So it's 0.5 mils. It's given into the muscle. So it's an intramuscular injection. And as a nurse, whenever you give intramuscular injections, sometimes people have some side effects that we'll talk about with that. They say it's about um, two weeks to develop a significant um, immunity. And then they say that uh, second dose, uh, four to 12 weeks later, and we're going to get into how that has recently changed given the pandemic situation. And again, AstraZeneca is about 65%, depending on the study that you read. Some advantages of a viral vector is they're easier to store. They can stay in a fridge for up to six months uh, versus five days for a Pfizer vaccine, an mRNA vaccine. So they're much sturdier um, viral vectors. They're easier to manufacture and they're shown to protect, as I said, against severe illness and death. Um, in general, the uh, signs and symptoms for any, any one of these vaccines, so we only have to say this one time, you'll get pain at the site because I'm going into a muscle. So it's like somebody kind of punched you and you might get body chills, you might get tired and you might feel uh, feverish. So those are the normal signs and symptoms. There is a chance that there can be a serious side effect from a vaccine and that's no different than it is in any other vaccine uh, chickenpox, measles, MM, MMRA um, uh, vaccines that children get. So what's important is to remember if you have a serious side effect. So a serious side effect, so AstraZeneca is the one that we're talking about, um, would be if you're short of breath, if you have chest pain, if your legs happen to swell, if you have abdominal pain that doesn't go away, if you start to have some uh, neurological symptoms like uh, sudden uh, or worsening types of headaches, if your vision kind of blurs and you can't see properly, any of those types of things or bleeding um, are really important that you seek medical attention. Those are the sort of adverse effects that we talk about, about thrombocytopenia or thrombosis, so either a blood clot or a bleed. Both of those are serious side effects. Um, there are studies that are being done currently. Um, so a European study reported 30 cases in 5 million people. Norway, Denmark, and Iceland actually paused it as a precautionary measure. Um, the deaths that were reported as they related to AstraZeneca were Norway 1, Italy 2, Austria 1, Denmark 1. Um, but what you need to remember is that NASI, that organization of safety and efficacy, um, is still on their website as of March 16th, have said, if you're over the age of 55, you can still get that, but you must be informed and give consent. And informed consent means you heard somebody describe risk and you said, yes, that's informed consent. Um, and you're going to sign that you understand that there is a potential risk and you would be given a paper with those signs and symptoms. Next slide. So Jensen is the exact same. It's a viral vector, um, exact same way, works the same way. The side effects are the same, but it's a one dose vaccine and it's not yet available in Canada. It's given the exact same way. The study of 43,000 participants on the Janssen study was 66% um, effective within two weeks. Next. So the side effects, again, slide 28 is just talking about the exact same uh, side effects. So we can move on. 
trials in the US, 75% uh, effective with 66% overall preventing moderate to severe COVID-19, 85% effectiveness at preventing severe disease and death, 72% in the States, 66% in Latin America, and 57% for the South African variant. Next slide, Moderna. So that's an mRNA vaccine that tells the proteins, remember I talked about those 10,000 proteins, it tells those proteins that you need to create an antibody. So it, it's um, a mechanism that, that tells your body to do something, which is the difference, as opposed to putting in a viral vector vaccine. When you get that vaccine, your cells will create an antibody using those proteins to break it down so they can recognize it. So Moderna and Pfizer are both an mRNA type of vaccine. Again, it's more costly to produce, it's more fragile to use, but it is very effective. Given the same way, 0 0.5 mils into the muscle of your arm, it works best with a second dose. Um, about a month apart maximum, but we're going to see again updates to that in subsequent slides. And based on the study of about 30,000 participants in the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine was 94.1 effective in preventing COVID-19 uh, 14 days after the second dose. Next. So exact same thing for side effects. You're gonna soreness, body chills, soreness at the site of the injection, body chills, feeling tired and feeling feverish. Any other serious symptoms, you need to go and get medical attention. Next slide. Pfizer, again, is an mRNA vaccine. Um, it works exactly the same way about creating immunity. So next slide. So you get 0 0.3 mils, so it's a lesser dose. Um, you get two doses. And they recommend, again, initially, that your second dose be 21 days later. And again, it takes about two weeks to develop significant uh, protection. Based on a study of 44,000 participants, um, the Pfizer vaccine was 95% effective in preventing COVID-19 beginning one week after the second dose. Side effects are the same. Injection site will be sore, body chills, feeling feverish. Um, tired. And again, if you get serious side effects from any, you're going to seek medical attention. So what are some of the side effects that people have talked about so far? Eight in 10 people complain of a sore arm, but only one in 100 call that soreness severe. Five in 10 people complain of fatigue and headache, but only one in 10 needed Advil. And side effects are an expected immune response to the vaccine. That's just a normal thing. The majority of them, as with all vaccines, are mild and manageable in your own home. Canadian vaccines are monitored uh, by an organization called Adverse Effects Following Immunization, or AFI, A-E-F-I, in Canada. So AEFI or AFI looks at any medical incidents that occur after somebody is vaccinated. They follow it very closely and they must report and review these to Public Health Canada. There's another organization called Canadian Vaccine Safety Network or CANVAS. They assess vaccine safety immediately after implementation. So we've talked about NACI, We've talked about AFI, and we've now talked about Canvas. So we're talking about three very distinct organizations that help to keep us safe when we're talking about vaccines. As of February 26th, according to AFI, 1,591 reports so 0.089% of all doses that we've had as of February 26, so less than 1%. 1,397 were non-serious. So the majority were non-serious. 194 were serious, or 0.011 of all doses. 
out of the 1.7 million doses that were given by February the 26th. So you can see it is significantly less, but I think we need to really remind ourselves about the 80-20 rule in life. We talk 80% more about negative things and 20% more about things that are good. So it's just a statistic that I think we need to keep in mind, especially given the length of time we've been uh, during in this pandemic. Next slide. Precautions for COVID-19 vaccines. Um, the symptoms of confirmed or suspected infection. Um, if you do have it, you want to not get your, your vaccine, but the best person to talk to is your doctor or your pharmacist, talk, especially if you have an ongoing uh, condition, you know, Crohn's, colitis, a particular disability, MS, MD. You want to make sure you speak to a subject matter expert, uh, your doctor, your clinical specialist, um, to make sure that you keep yourself safe. Um, if you've had a transplant, for example, there's lots of different situations that we want to make sure that you're talking to the right people um, before you get your, your vaccine. If you've had a vaccine, say the flu shot, um, you want to wait for 14 days, public health is uh, telling us, and people less than 16 years of age um, who they're still doing clinical trials on. Next slide. So not everybody can get a vaccine, we know that. Uh, some is because of hesitancy, I don't wanna get my vaccine, and other is because of ongoing health conditions that I just talked about. So what we try to do is create something called herd immunity. So when we think of herd immunity, I'll go back to the measles. In The measles um, vaccine was, was um, first given in 1963, and the measles vaccine, in order to create herd immunity, meaning I wanna protect those people who can't get vaccinated. So I give it to 95% of people. So in order to create herd immunity for measles, 95% of the population, children, need that injection. Because of hesitancy, we don't always get to 95%. And sadly, there are still countries that are having issues with herd immunity because um, people are choosing not to get vaccinated. Next slide. Okay, I think I covered that. Next slide. So what you see on the screen um, is an individual and it's a male individual and he has a little bubble around him. That little bubble means he got vaccinated. So it's protecting him. So now we go to the next slide and what you see is a intergenerational group of people. It's a uh, diverse in culture. And what you see is five people, two people couldn't get vaccinated, and three out of those five did get vaccinated. So now what we have is herd immunity. The people who got vaccinated will not be able to hopefully get ill, which means they won't be giving the people who didn't get vaccinated illness. So herd immunity means we get a potential group of people who are vaccinated that will then help to protect those people who could not or would not. The numbers have gone anywhere in my research from 40 to 70 to 90%. So now they're saying in the recent research I read through the Center for Disease Control in the US, um, because of the three variants, the B117, the B1351, And the P1, because of those three variants, we need 90%. But remember, this is so new, so it's ever evolving. Next slide. So one vaccine um, dose may not be enough. So Janssen, we know, is a one dose, but the other three are two doses. So what do we need to do? We still need to practice physical distancing, stay home as much as you can, wear a face mask as appropriate, cough or sneeze into your elbow um, or into your um, crux of your elbow, sorry, or into a Kleenex, throw it in the garbage and wash, wash, wash your hands. Next slide. Why do people have vaccine hesitancy? It's a very complex reason. So sometimes it's a history of um, individuals culturally 
who may have been misused around vaccines, misunderstood around vaccines. There's lots of uncertainty. There is um, you know, people that believe it changes our DNA. All the research says it can't change our DNA. Um, so there is lots of, of, of hesitancy. Sadly, uh, in Canada, as, as well as in other wealthy countries, our vaccine hesitancy has increased in recent years. So we know that every year in order to create herd immunity, that if we do get vaccines, vaccines prevent two to three million less deaths in children around the world. That's a significant portion of our, our young vulnerable community. In 2019, the WHO, which is the World Health Organization, listed vaccine hesitancy as one of the 10 threats to global health. That's significant. And what we're hoping to do in this webinar is to create some comfort for some informed decision-making around vaccination. COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy, uh, 12 things you need to know, according to the John Hopkins, uh, which is another great place to get information. Number one, getting the COVID-19 vaccine can protect you. Black, Indigenous, and people of color are especially vulnerable to severe COVID-19. COVID-19 helps people in your community. It means we can get back to normal or whatever that normal is going to look like sooner. It was fast, the development of the vaccine, but no steps were missed as you saw in that video. Vaccine testing helped assess safety and effectiveness. The side effects are no different than any other vaccine that we have seen. What if you have allergies? You can still uh, get your vaccine, but make sure you check with your doctor as with any other healthcare condition. Pregnant or breastfeeding women uh, should discuss that information with their doctor as well. In the resources John is going to share, uh, there's some great information from the Center for Disease Control as well. If you've had COVID-19, um, you can still get the vaccine. It will add extra protection. Time is of the essence. We need to get more people vaccinated. You see Ford talking about that every single day. And vaccines can't save our lives or prevent serious illness if people choose not to get vaccinated. Next slide. Vaccine confidence, according to Angus Reid, July 2020, 46% of Canadians were willing to get it as soon as possible. September, only 39% would get vaccinated. November, 40% said they would get vaccinated. December, 48% said they'd get vaccinated. And in January, we were up to a whopping 60%. So I'm hoping that number will increase based on the fact that variants, um, especially the B117 and the B1351 uh, bind more easily and spread more quickly. So I think it's really important um, that we, this is my own personal opinion, that we increase our vaccinated individuals. Next slide. The rate of vaccine confidence in healthcare workers often mirrors that of the regular population. So 76% are strong supporters in Canada, 17% are undecided, and 7% oppose the vaccine. Unfortunately, about 50% of our personal support workers were not confident about COVID-19 vaccines. Um, healthcare workers tend to be lower wage, racialized females, part-time workers, and more impacted by the determinants of health. So they lack that vaccine confidence. Next slide. The confidence um, age rate for the lower confidence is 18 to 34 year olds, those with a visible minority, those who have children, those who have a household income of less than $40,000, and just an unsureness about the safety of vaccines. Those who completely say, I don't want a vaccine, tend to be in the 18 to 34 years of age believe vaccines are harmful, tend to work in more manufacturing. John, uh, Tim, just a moment. Sure. Just allow for the interpreters to catch up for just a moment. Sorry about that. Thank you. Okay. Um, history of trauma. 
discrimination, the areas that we looked at in vaccine confidence ethnically were Blacks, 47% had concerns, Indigenous, 38%, Middle Eastern, 35%, Latinx, 32%, South Asian, 30%, East Asian, 28%, and those of white, 25%. Next slide. There's a number of studies that have been done and I just think in the um, essence of time, John, it's, it's five to one. Maybe I'll just leave this part and um, go to the section five objective. Uh, people can read about studies. There's lots of different studies. So the, the vaccine rollout, um, there were three stages. The first stage was December 2020 to March 21, which was um, approximately 1.8 million people. It talked about high risk groups. Uh, sadly, the disabled community was um, not part of that group, but John's going to talk about um, how that has been um, addressed and how that uh, has uh, greater access when we think about individuals with um, a disability fitting into this high risk group number one. So next slide. So now um, we're in the April um, to July uh, format, and we're talking about shelters, group homes, um, correctional facilities, uh, migrant worker housing, people 60 to 79. But I'm sure as you've seen on the news, um, you know some areas are, are, are opening it up to people 55 years of age and high risk areas, um, racialized, marginalized, first responders, Um, so there's lots of, I'll just keep going, John, I'll let people read that um, on their own for the stages. I think that's information people can read. So group number three or stage number three past July 21 would be our 16 to 59 year old uh, individuals, non frontline healthcare workers, and adults 50 to 59 without any healthcare underlying uh, con conditions. Mass vaccinations, pharmacies, primary care, um, doctors, mobile clinics, all those things you're seeing on the news are where those things are happening. How do you get um, a vaccine? So if we keep going, John, next slide. So how do you book your vaccine? As of April 20, sorry, 2nd, um, they're, oh, the clinics are open seven days a week, eight in the morning till eight at night. The website is there. It's covid-19.ontario.ca. There's a phone number, 1-888-999-6488. Um, There's a TTY uh, number is 1-866-797-0007. So that's our TTY line. Um, you can call for somebody who is struggling to make, make appointments, and John's going to talk specifically about your community. Um, there is age eligibility. Um, there are different um, public health units doing things differently. So there's another slide, if we keep moving, John, there's a slide that talks about how to, to find your public health unit, um, the one that you're, you're assigned to. Um, so you're if you're going to go with the AstraZeneca, remember you need to have in, uh, formed consent. You need to be over the age of 55, according to NASI. We're going to still give it to people over the age of 55. And there, um, again, you would go on the website and you just have to prove that you've got an OHIP uh, number or a HIN number in order to uh, get that. Next slide, John. So um, when you go on, you'll be asked to pick your group eligibility. So there's there are little drop down menus. So you'll pick your eligible group and it'll just open up and you'll find which one you fit into. Um, once you pick your eligible group, you put in your postal code. Um, if you're moved recently and you're in a new subdivision and you don't have a postal code, get something that's close by like a library, a police station, something that's close by and use their postal code. You'll click start and it will bring up the clinics and where you can book your vaccine. If you don't know um, where to find your public health, on slide 64, you can enter your postal code in that website, which is www.pbhealth.ca 
P H D A P P S dot health dot G O V dot on dot C A forward slash P H U locator forward slash. So the website is there. You can go there. All you have to do is put in your postal code and it'll bring you up to your public health unit. Next slide. So if you are a um, housebound individual in Toronto, they are making arrangements for EMS to come to your house to do your vaccination. So if you call your doctor, your doctor will help you to coordinate that. If you are receiving home care services, so the Lynn just changed their name yet again um, to uh, home care services. So you would call and speak to your Lynn coordinator. So if you get home care, call your Lynn coordinator and that person will help you to navigate the EMS. Um, if you're struggling um, and you aren't uh, in Toronto, you can still call your Lynn coordinator and um, your attendant service provider can also provide you a letter saying you do receive chronic home care services so that you can be in the higher priority group. And again, there's a website there for and a phone number um, to be able to access that. If you are outside of those two regions and are homebound, you should contact your medical doctor uh, for providing access. This is all about advocacy, which John's going to talk about in a bit. Next slide. So the direct funding program, I think I'll leave that for direct funding um, managers, but um, they basically what's happening is that they should have been in phase number one and they weren't. Um, so there's a letter for recipients um, who are direct funded self managers and or their caregivers um, to be able to be moved up in the queue to get their vaccine quicker. The um, website or person for direct funding is Sarah Stone at SILT or Brittany Hudson at SILT that you can contact. Next slide. Next slide, they can read that on their own. Uh, this is basically explaining to us that with Pfizer, Moderna, and AstraZeneca, um, that NACI, that organization I talked about at the beginning, has actually said, based on the risk, which is not enough vaccine to create herd immunity, they've now extended the second shot of your vaccine for up to 16 weeks even though it was recommended, it should be done in 21 to 28 days, but NACI is confirming that it's okay to go to that 16 weeks because the risk is much too high with not enough people vaccinated because we simply don't have enough vaccine. They also say on the government website, I checked today um, before this session, that by the fall, there is enough Pfizer and Moderna going to be received by the fall to vaccinate everybody in Canada, our 33 plus million people. There's some socio-demographic data. So just so you know, um, that again, we try to get as much information about race and ethnicity and language, et cetera. So you may be asked to voluntarily give that information. I personally um, did that when I got my first shot. Uh, I think it's important to help us create that sort of awareness about why we have so much vaccine um, hesitancy versus people who are willing. So then we can try to create more knowledge and informed decision making, but it's totally voluntary. Next. Uh, next. Um, uh, just to add, um, can you hear me, Tim? Yep. Just to add, so you said it was voluntary and if you change your mind, um, there is a contact at the Ministry of Health through the Health Equity Impact Assessment at the website, I mean, the email address at h-e-i-a at ontario.ca if you want to withdraw your consent to be part of um, the data collected. 
Yeah, yeah. With anything in healthcare, you can always withdraw your consent at any given time. Thanks, John. Okay. All right, you're up, sir. Yeah, I'm going to start my video. Uh, oops, I don't see myself here, but um, I can see you, John. Uh, can people see me? Yep. Yep. Okay. So um, I would like to talk about um, vaccine advocacy and equity here. Um, we know with alarm that NASI removed disabled Canadians living with chronic medical conditions from both phase one and phase two vaccine priority groups. Um, but they had included us in the earlier drafts. Um, as a result, people with disabilities with chronic care conditions, you know, we will have to wait probably until phase three, as some uh, people with disabilities may have to wait till phase three. Uh, those who are receiving chronic care, home care, are prioritized in phase one. Um, but um, through these next couple of slides, we will show some messaging that we can, you know, give to our, our elected politicians and healthcare professionals to assist us in trying to get the vaccine sooner than later. So um, we are asking the government of Canada to take the following steps. And it's important that to give people with disabilities with chronic medical conditions, uh, you know, COVID places at greater risk and we should be included in, in the ethical framework for the distribution of COVID-19. We would like government to consult with us, especially Canadians with living with chronic care medical conditions and to devise a, you know, a more equitable vaccine strategy. And that means, you know, holding state stakeholder meetings or uh, asking uh, the Honorable Carla, Carla Cottrell, a Minister of Disability at the federal level to include, you know, people with disabilities living with chronic medical conditions. And we also ask that they appoint a person with a disability to, to NASI or any decision-making table for vaccines. So some of the barriers that we've heard for people with disabilities in trying to get the COVID vaccine is that, you know, we are not prioritized and we don't really have access and clear communication on the vaccine rollout in various regions in Ontario and Canada. There are access barriers of access accommodations such as the need for a support person or a PSW to attend with a person with a disability to a vaccination clinic. There's the importance of having American Sign Language interpreters at vaccine clinics and having accessible information in alternative formats in plain language for people with disabilities. There's also technological barriers Having to book online, people with disabilities may not have internet access or may need assistance with booking appointments online or by phone. Some other barriers are the cost and the need to coordinate transportation, parking, and a support person. And the cost of transportation PSW to attend with the person with a disability. And the need for more PPE throughout the whole rollout as you need to wear PPE when you attend these vaccination clinics. So there are some self-advocacy tools. And this is just a small uh, small uh, list of some self-advocacy tools. It's important to either have a phone or Zoom meeting with your doctor, specialist, local health integrated network LIN coordinator, your attendant service manager, if you have one, or your local provincial federal uh, politician. 
it's important you can write a good email or a letter. You can use social media like Twitter or Facebook. And you can work with the media. And there's a link here of an excellent article that I'll be sharing this PowerPoint presentation with everyone of a story about a woman and her challenges in trying to get the vaccine uh, in Toronto. So a sample vaccine advocacy message, and I'll read it. Um, the first message is, hello, my name, you put your name, my name is John Massa. I am a resident of the city of Toronto. I'm disabled. I'm high risk for COVID-19 and I need to get vaccinated. Seniors, disabled people and higher weight people have died of COVID-19 in greatest numbers, especially those who are black, Latino and indigenous. People of all ages who are at risk must have access to vaccines right away. We know you can help make this happen. Please act now. The other message is very similar, but it's a message from an ally and a friend or a family member. So you could use this, add to it, change it, modify it as a basic vaccine advocacy message that you can use. You can also use social media and there are really some really good relevant Twitter hashtag. What a hashtag is, is a place where you can put this hashtag at ready for my shot and a list of tweets will come up of people you know, with their messages or you could type in vaccine equity, high risk and nobody's disposable. And a sample social media post is Prime Minister Trudeau or Premier Ford or Mayor Tory, who's the city of Toronto mayor. Um, every day we experience ableism, ageism, racism, and sizeism. Every day there are new vaccine plans that fail to get vaccines in the arms of high risk people with disabilities of all ages, especially communities of color. When will this change? And adding the hashtag of vaccine equity, high risk, nobody is disposable and ready for my shot. There are several other messages there that you can use and modify. There's also, you can create a Zoom background and it will be attached to your PowerPoint and the image is below is a light blue background with the text at the top that says, I am at high risk CA, meaning Canada. And the text at the bottom says, nobody is disposable. There's also um, in the city of Toronto, there's arch disability law that is collecting stories and um, information about people experience barriers to vaccine. And uh, they have a toll-free number, 1-866-482-2724, or you could contact them by email at A-R-C-H-I-N-T-A-K-E at L-A-O .on.ca. Arch wants to develop uh, their understanding of barriers facing people with disabilities in getting the vaccine. So if you're an adult uh, recipient of chronic home care, and even if you received the COVID vaccine or in the process of receiving one or have not been able to make an appointment to get the vaccine, Arch invites you to complete this questionnaire with the link at the bottom and people will be sent this uh, with the presentation and also with the resources. Silt and Miles Nadal have also uh, are going to be starting a new disability vaccine outreach initiative. And it's funded by the city. We just got funded by the city 
to support a community vaccine engagement clusters to build capacity and how to outreach to people with disabilities in our communities um, by engaging grassroots organizations in the GTA and forming a, a forming a steering committee uh, by people with disabilities for people with disabilities. Um, we were going to work together to identify the barriers to vaccines for people with disabilities. And each organization will try to do cross disability organizations to develop outreach webinar specific information to engage community ambassadors so that if people with disabilities have questions from their disability organization, they can go and get the support they need to get the steps to get the vaccine or get vaccinated. There'll be training opportunities throughout this project. And this presentation is a stepping stone to more specific disability specific organizations. Um, and the initiative will run from April of this year to March of 2022. For more information, please contact uh, David Myers, my senior manager of independent living programs at the email of David, D-A-V-I-D dot M-E-Y-E-R-S at silt.ca. So I just wanna share you with you my vaccine story um, and I'll try to be quick. So the first picture uh, that's on the screen is of me wearing a face shield and a mask in my wheelchair, wearing a short sleeve t-shirt at St. Mike's Hospital vaccine clinic. The second picture is of a doctor giving me the COVID vaccine in my left arm at the St. Mike's Hospital clinic. So my story is that about four weeks ago, my lame case coordinator called me and asked if I would like to get the home EMS to come to my home to vaccinate me. And I said, yes, because I have a chronic medical condition and I have not been outside of my house only twice in the last year. Um, the thing is though, that was about four weeks ago and two weeks passed and nothing was happening and I wasn't getting any calls from EMS and the cases of COVID were rising. So I spoke with my attendant service provider and they provided me with a document called, you are eligible for COVID-19 vaccine, Toronto Central Lynn home and community care home and community phase one client. They provided me with that document. And I also got a letter from my Lynn case coordinator saying that I'm a person with chronic medical condition and I live in a congregate setting. The reason why I did this was because as I mentioned, you know, I wasn't hearing anything from EMS and with the rise of COVID cases, I have a real concern as I have about 20 PSWs that come to see me in a week. So I tried booking using the online of vaccineto.ca. Everything was booked and I was getting a little frustrated. So I decided to actually call the number that will be in your resources for vaccine TO. And to my surprise, they told me that they hold uh, appointments for people who don't have internet access. Um, and I was able to book an appointment on April 3rd and I got my injection. Uh, the phone number that I called was 1-888-385-1910. And so I had to arrange wheel trans and a support person to go with me. I brought the above documents of um, a consent form and also the form that my 
the tenant service provider gave me and my Ontario health card, but I had the old red and white. So I needed to bring picture ID using a passport. So coordinating all this on the weekend, I finally got my COVID shot. It was the Pfizer at St. Mike's and it was administered by a doctor. My next appointment will be uh, three or four months and it will be in July. So it is possible, um, but you know, there's still a lot of work to do to get people with disabilities vaccinated. So I'm gonna pass it back to Tim to give a summary of um, the presentation. Okay, thanks Chuck. Um, can you hear me? My video won't work. Oh, okay, there we go. Awesome. So there are um, four approved vaccines. So three of them we're currently using right now. Research is in its infancy, so we have to be patient. Vaccines prevent the spread of the virus. Um, vaccine efficacy, so how well it works is still under investigation. Herd immunity is anywhere 40 to 70% before the addition of the variants, and now they're saying it's 90%. You may be asymptomatic, meaning you show no symptoms, but you could still infect other individuals. Some people may be in contact and not become ill while others do. So it, it doesn't matter it, if who you are, or how strong you are, it affects different people different ways. Next slide. So public health still says good IPAC. So IPAC was the first three sessions that we did. So good hand hygiene, stay six feet apart, Stay home if you're ill, receive notification from your consumer or employer, use your routine practices, which is all your PPE, good hand hygiene, exercise, de-stress, keep your immunizations up to date, get your annual flu shot. These are all things public health is recommending. Next slide. So um, I'll, I'll do objective seven and I'll just Briefly, can people see my video? Yes. Okay. So in uh, your handouts, as well as this PowerPoint, there's some uh, basic resources, um, how to get your vaccine in Toronto. There's the Toronto Hospital uh, vaccination registration, the vaccine, vaccine to.ca, and the phone number that I mentioned that how I got my vaccine shot. Then there's the website for Ontario for people outside of Toronto that could go to this website and phone number to get uh, registered to get a vaccine and then information Canada wide. So um, these next few slides are about vaccine information and disability specific organizations. There's some really excellent guides by the University Health Network on resources for patients and families. They have some really excellent specific uh, guidance on people who have transplants, cancer, diabetes, liver disease, thrombosis, MS, rheumatic conditions, inflammatory bowel disease, pregnancy and breastfeeding. And then there's more specific disability organizations that have information and some webinars. Um, and so there, there's this list that people can choose if it relates to them. And I want to mention specifically neuromuscular disorders or muscular dystrophy Canada really put together an excellent webinar on um, 
vaccines with frequently asked questions as a resource document and also a decision aid document to give you guidance. One thing about the Ontario Federation of Cerebral Palsy, they have a vaccine support fund for people who have cerebral palsy and they need to apply directly on their website and the link is there. Um, there are some vaccine advocacy organizations. There was an open letter by this national organization, grassroots organization called Include Me. And there's also a grassroots action toolkit that was created in the state that you can modify as well. And then there's some general information for Ontario and Canada and the World Health Organization if you want to get more information about vaccine. So at this point, we're gonna, we'll, we're gonna do Q and A and I'll pass it to Rebecca to ask the questions uh, that Tim will answer and maybe myself and um, maybe someone from Direct Funding if they're here. Um, and so I'll, I'll pass it to Rebecca to ask the questions. Thank you, John. Um, I have a number of questions here and I just want to acknowledge, as John mentioned, this is going to be the first of many uh, disability specific um, vaccine webinars coming up. So if your specific question does not get answered today, um, we are happy to follow up and do some research. Um, some are very general, some are very specific. So. Um, Tim, we have a number of questions about the safety and efficacy about the 16 week wait time um, between first and second dose and, and whether, whether that's a concern, whether it's possible that when we have more vaccines, um, people might be able to get them sooner. Mm -hmm. So great question. Um, so again, I would, encourage people to go to the NACI website um, and stay posted with NACI because they're the ones who really update that information. Um, basically, what we've got in research is sort of a five month mark from my research that people who have had the infection and or people who have gotten um, the vaccine have about five months worth of significant protection. So by looking at a, a risk benefit analysis, which is how we look at these things is balancing risk with benefit. The fact that we need to get more people vaccinated with their first dose is the benefit. So the risk in extending it to 16 weeks, we're still in that sort of, if you wanna use the term safety net of the time frame based on the research that's done so far, which is around five months of immunity post infection or post first shot. Thanks, Tim. Um, John, we're wondering if we can stop sharing the screen so that the interpreters are uh, in a bigger window. I see you've done that. Um, Relatedly, Tim, uh, there's a question whether um, if you get one type of vaccine for your first dose, do you have to get the same type of vaccine for your second dose? Okay, so the, the research is still going on from my initial research um, that I have done, and I haven't looked at that in probably two to three weeks, um, but the research is still being done on the safety of of it, um, so I don't have a black and white answer. Sorry. That's okay. Thank you. It's an ever evolving situation. Okay. Um, there are a number of questions about the safety of seeing friends and family after you've received your first dose. So once you receive your first dose, you wait the two week period. Um, is it safe to start? seeing people or should everybody wait till they receive both doses of the vaccine? So what um, public health is saying is you need to follow 
your guidance from your your local public health. So as we all know, we're we're in a lockdown uh, type of situation now. And again, Rebecca, the, the research is, is ever evolving and so new. So public health is saying, even though you had your vaccine, you still need to follow all those protocols, wear a mask, hand hygiene, et cetera, et cetera. So you could still potentially, because remember, you can still get infected by getting the vaccine, you have a reduced adverse effect or hospitalization. So it's reducing it. It doesn't mean it's taking it away 100%. You can still get sick. So maybe you're going to be asymptomatic and take that to somebody who's going to get sick. Why would we want to do that? I think that and we need to still follow pub, our own individual public health and think about safety. And right now we're, you know, we're not supposed to be um, socializing, right? In our areas. Thank you. Um, this question is more of an advocacy question. Um, so this person's employer will not allow staff to get the vaccine during work hours and is requiring people to use free time, um, which is challenging for some people. Um, do you have any suggestions of how to work with employers to make this situation more manageable for staff? That's a, that's a very sad st statement, actually, uh, given our, our pandemic. Um, I would hope that the individual could go higher if that's a supervisor uh, to a highest level of management that they could uh, possibly go to. Um, if it was me, I would contact um, human rights to, I think given our pandemic, you need to be as vocal as possible. Um, and I, I think human rights might be a place uh, that you could go to. Um, I don't know if anybody on the SILT team has something to add, John? Maybe? Um, well, I would also um, maybe uh, approach Arch with that story and see what advice they can give as well. Uh, I would approach your, you and your local or provincial politician. Maybe they can have some sway. Um, and um, th those are the steps I would take. And feeling that you can call me at SILT and we can strategize. There'd be, if they have a health and safety committee, um, the health and safety rep might be somebody who could advocate for them as well because it, it does present a health and safety risk. And then, and if not, then I would um, contact Occupational Health and Safety uh, Ontario. That might be a place to go to as well. Wow, that's sad. Thank you so much. Um, there are a number of questions about uh, getting the vaccine if you are an asymptomatic carrier or if you've already had COVID, um, is there risks of getting uh, the COVID vaccine? So if you're asymptomatic, you're not going to actually know you have COVID, right? So the Center for Disease Control and John, you um, is going either did send or it's included in that um, resources. The Center for Disease Control says there is no reason that's in the US um, to believe the vaccine would have negative effects if you're an asymptomatic carrier. If you are quarantining because you are ill with COVID, you need to wait until the 14 day quarantine is over and speak to your, your um, medical um, practitioner to make sure. Was there another part to that question, Rebecca? Sorry, I think I missed something. Um. No, it was basically just whether it's dangerous if, oh, if you've already had COVID. So if your body has already produced natural antibodies, right. if it's risky. So, yeah. So what they're doing is research studies. Um, so uh, on individuals um, that have had vaccine, they're doing research studies um, to see what the booster does, for example, because they, you know, if you've had it, they say you've got about five months of natural immunity, um, but they're, so they're giving them the shot and then they're, they're following people um, in that clinical third phase to see um, how much immunity they're getting. But again, and I hate to keep, it sounds like I'm, I'm using this as my buffer, but there's just not enough research yet. There's not enough time. 
Yes, it's it, the research is happening as we speak. Right. Um, John, this might be a, more of an advocacy, advocacy question and direct funding might have some, some suggestions here, but how can we, res, re, excuse me, how can we address vaccine hesitancy among personal support workers? Can we require our staff to get the vaccine? Um, my understanding that it is not mandatory uh, for um, healthcare workers or PSWs. Um, what they people can do is share parts of this presentation if PSWs are open to the idea uh, of, of some of the points we made about the effectiveness of the four uh, vaccines and the you know, minimal to moderate side effects and the importance of having herd immunity for us to get back to some sense of normalcy. Um, but uh, vaccine hesitancy is complex and um, we have to make sure that, um, you know, we're respecting uh, um, people's decisions. And I would defer to direct funding if they are a self manager about what other steps they can take. Uh, you know, it's about protecting themselves, right? Like as a consumer. Yeah. Um, so I'll pass it to Lisa if she has any more. Thanks, John. Um, there is uh, one other thing that I would recommend to self managers. Uh, and that is uh, that uh, self-managers received a COVID-19 payment uh, recently. And one of the ways that payment can be used is actually to allow your staff to watch this video, for example. So you can pay your staff for the time that they would need to educate themselves on the vaccine through a video such as this. Awesome. And just for people to know, Lisa DeBono is the direct funding manager for the direct funding program for Ontario. All right, thank you. Um, just going, there's a number of questions. Um, do we have a choice about which vaccine we will receive? Only if you're getting the AstraZeneca. That's an informed choice and decision that you make. Okay. And connected to the AstraZeneca, um, when you were talking about thrombosis, if someone is experiencing extreme side effects, uh, would they still be able to walk? Uh, yeah, in my experience as a nurse and being an ER nurse before a palliative nurse, um, people have come into the hospital walking with that condition. Um, they're compromised, so very short of breath, very fatigued. Um, when we're talking about an embolus, um, they can barely walk, um, but yet very fatigued. You want to watch for the shortness of breath, chest pain, leg swelling, that persistent abdominal pain, the neurological symptoms where you're, you know, feeling confused, your, your vision may blur and bleeding is the, the bleeding issue that can be caused by it. So you would see lots of easy bruising, bleeding when you're brushing your teeth. Um, you get a odd little smooth rash called petechiae. Um, that is, um, a little funny rash that you that you get. It's flat. Um, it's usually red. Um, depending on your skin tone, your skin tone will change because it's a flat, not a raised um, kind of rash. Um, and petechiae, um, when you, if you put your finger over top of the rash area and you push down on it, and then you take your finger away, you'll see on your normal skin, it changes color, right? When you've got that petechiae type of rash, it doesn't change color. It stays the same when you press on it. So that's one way of telling. Thank you, Tim. Okay. Sorry, just a moment, okay, for the interpreters, just a second. Sorry.
Great, thank you. Thanks. It's a lot of information. Yes. Um, and I, I'm just seeing a few questions in the chat that yes, we will be distributing the recording of this webinar along with the resources and information afterwards. And that's something um, you can can take a look at and, and share resources. Specifically, there's a number of people asking about um, specific diagnoses, conditions. Um, so we'll be sending uh, some links and resources so you can take a look at what individual disability specific organizations are saying about the vaccine. Um, there's a question about the safety of uh, personal support workers have been vaccinated, but the person they are supporting has not. Um, do they need to get vaccinated is the first question. And um, is are they still at risk if the people supporting them have been vaccinated? Sure, I, the risk is always there. So remember, no vaccine is 100%. So there's, there's always a risk. So uh, herd immunity is the only way that we can minimize that risk. And um, what they're saying now, again, is 90% of people need to be vaccinated for herd immunity. So the risk definitely is there. So follow those IPAC principles that we talked about. And just to interject that, uh, I mean, um, most of my PSWs have uh, received uh, the COVID vaccine, but my medical condition is such that I know that uh, if I get COVID, I probably would not survive. So it was really important for me, not only to be on the EMS list, but as I saw the cases rise, and rising in, a, in Toronto and in Ontario, I decided that I need to be more active in, and go and get the vaccine. So um, to add additional layer of uh, protection for me, that's if you can, and that's if you're eligible, so. And I think just to add to your advocacy piece that you were talking about earlier, John, or trying to convince people, you and Lisa, I think, you know, you just jogged my memory in that, you know, one in every hundred people that are hospitalized with COVID end up needing intensive care. So that's a significant portion of uh, individuals. And one in five of every hospitalized COVID patient gets a blood clot regardless. So blood clots are something that happen with this disease process. And I need to add something else. Um, this is actually maybe a different workshop, but the fact that ICUs are now getting to a point where it is uh, critical. They have a triage protocol, T-R-I-A-G-E protocol, where it can discriminate uh, who gets ICU beds and respirators. And people with disabilities um, have been deprioritized basically with this um, um, triage protocol. Another important reason for me to go and get the COVID mm -hmm. shot. Um, so, uh, if you can, um, and you're eligible, um, uh, I would recommend uh, people if they can go get the vaccine shot. Mm -hmm. uh, but that that is a personal decision and I leave it up to people with disabilities to make those choices. There is a question about eligibility, um, both how to find out if you're eligible and what you need to provide as proof that you are eligible. Is that specifically related for a disabled person, Rebecca? Yes. John, do you 
So, um, I mean, in the earlier slides about um, about specifically uh, for you know uh, for my 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 experience is that I would have to go. I went to a hospital to get a vaccine, but I was considered under the umbrella of an adult recipient of chronic care services, meaning I receive attendant services, but my condition is chronic care. And so I, I fit under phase one, but it was through advocacy with my attendant service provider, my Lynn case coordinator and my family doctor saying that I really needed to get this shot. Um, for those people not receiving attendant services or chronic care, it becomes a little bit more difficult in fitting into phase two. It looks more like phase three uh, of eligibility. But as we see every day and every week, um, there's a lowering of the age group and also prioritizing of marginalized communities. So I would always check your public health unit in your city that you live in to see if things have been updated and changed. Uh, and also for you to advocate with your, with your doctor, your Lynn case coordinator, attendant service provider, to get those uh, forms, the adult recipient of chronic care. Call the, the phone numbers that we are gonna be providing you for either provincially or for your uh, hospitals in your area to see if you're eligible and um, make that appointment. And if you have any barriers, you can call Arch, tell them your story. They can give you some legal advice. You can call Silt and myself and we can try to work things where we can try to help advocate for you to get the vaccine. John, I just uh, wanted to quickly add, I know that it was in the presentation, but uh, all participants on the direct funding program and all attendants who work for participants on the direct funding program were included in phase one and are eligible, if you haven't received it yet, for the vaccine now. Any participant who did not get a letter from us should contact us and we will forward a letter identifying you as a chronic recipient of home care and your attendant will get a similar letter identifying them as the highest priority home health care worker. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. You know, I want to acknowledge um, that when Ontario says phase two will open, it sounds like it's all going to happen at once. But what we're seeing is that every neighborhood, every public health unit is opening based on availability and what they're able to do. So that's why we're saying, um, you know, use that website tool to find out your local public health unit and find out what's going on um, and how you can register nearby. And again, uh, please, if you need support um, finding that contact information, um, we're gonna send out the resource list afterwards and you can also send me an email and I'm happy to help you um, locate that information. Um, there's a question about receiving the vaccine uh, in one location, um, and this might be something we follow up personally, but typically if you receive a vaccine from one public health unit, um, do you receive your second dose from the same public health unit? That's my understanding, uh, Rebecca, is because everybody is uh, associated with a public health unit. You might be at a different clinic, but you're associated with the same public health unit and they're trying to keep it the same for geography. Okay. Um, and I'm not sure whether either of you know this, but are people with disabilities um, part of the ongoing research and testing about the vaccine? 
Is there data collection around um, disability and things like side effects, reactions, um, vaccine information we might need? And anytime they do research for a vaccine and including on this vaccine, you have to have uh, multifaceted, intergenerational, uh, multicultural, um, different disease, uh, people you know, with, with chronic conditions. Um, so that's how you, you run a, a study. I'm not an expert in that, but in, in any study, you have to have a cohort that is demonstrated in order to minimize risk and predict outcomes. So you have to include everybody uh, within that. So yes, that would include people with disabilities. Thank you. Um, there were a few questions about COVID variants. Will the vaccine, do we know if the vaccine will be effective against different variants? Um, and connected, if you, are worried you're sick and you get a COVID test, do they tell you if you have COVID-19 or if you have a variant of COVID-19? Yeah, so yes, they do. So you know what you have. Um, remember the two variants, so B117 is the one that's most prevalent in Ontario now. I think 64% is the last percentage I recall. Um, and it travels quite easily. So it, it's much more virulent. Um, and um, Dr. Michael from Michael Guerin Hospital um, said that if someone in a family household gets the B117, most likely the entire family will get that. So he's a doctor that's on the news every single day. Um, so that was most recent news. And I'm sorry, Rebecca, I answered the second part. I forgot the first part of your question, sorry. Uh, that's okay. The first part was about uh, efficacy of the current vaccine with um, variants. Variant. Right. Sorry, so um, what the CDC says is that there's initial evidence to show some support no specific data against the variants. Thanks, Tim. And, and do we think that this vaccine will become an annual shot, like the flu shot every year? So the World Health Organization, so that's one of the resources John talked about. Um, that's my favorite go-to. So um, if you want quick information, if you go to the WHO and type science in five. So if you just type in your Google search, WHO, science in five, they've got 30 five minute videos available about COVID-19. And um, one of them deals uh, exactly with that subject matter. Thank you. Um, once more people get vaccinated, um, we have a number of questions about frequent COVID tests, like health authorities wanting weekly tests for staff, schools wanting uh, tests for children after every possible symptom. Um, mm. Do we think that the frequency of testing will continue uh, as vaccines get distributed? I can only talk about my personal experience in uh, long-term care. So right now, three times a week, rapid tests are done for everybody um, coming into long-term care um, as a worker and any of the residents. When they do experience an outbreak, then they go back to the traditional COVID swab test, you know, that goes right up your nose. Um, they, they go back to that, which is um, every seven days. So that's what's happening currently. Um, and again, I think because it's so new, um, we're really 
having to wait and see. I mean, school boards are really pushing in my other life as a high school teacher, are really pushing the testing as well. So I think um, we're going to see things changing quickly on the dime. Um, Rebecca? Yes. We have time for one more question, and then we need to do an evaluation from the group. Yes. Um, I was going to make that our last question. So now I'm looking for, there are so many questions. Um, and again, we're happy to follow up with more information. Um, Tim or John, do you have any information on, um, we talked about if you're homebound and need the vaccine, uh, but if, for example, someone is on the autism spectrum or has mental health concerns and getting the vaccine in a typical location might be a challenge for them. Do you have any suggestions about who to contact or how to um, address vaccine uh, concerns in that case? John, there was a, you know that last document I sent you um, from, and I'm, I'm losing the name, but it was a mental health organization that produced a document impacting <clears throat> talking about the impact of people with disabilities. Um, I'm just, I'm totally gapping. I think you added it to the resources. Did you, John? To... Uh, I will add it to the resources when we do the handouts. Okay. Um, but I would suggest that to approach your family doctor first um, and um, talk and list the access accommodations that uh, you're, that you're, um, son or daughter needs um, and choose what's best either uh, like a, a mobile home visit uh, if it's safer or um, a vaccine clinic uh, and maybe um, speaking to the people that you register with about some of the access accommodations that would be needed. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything Tim? Yeah, no, I think that's that's great. And if you have an again an organization, autism, CAMH, um, I was really impressed by that research I had done last minute um, by that organization that John's going to add, and I, I really found their information quite useful. So that it's a new resource for me. So maybe that will help as well. Okay, uh, so I just want to say some of the resources that are going to be handed out. Uh, this PowerPoint with all the uh, web links from the vaccine resources that I listed above. Uh, within 24 hours, we should have a Zoom recording of this event. And, um, and so there'll be a number of handouts coming to everyone who registered within the next 24 to 48 hours. And I would like it to pass it to Rebecca to ask some evaluate, evaluation questions. Um, and, and so I'll pass it back to you, Rebecca. Thanks, everyone. Uh, we are going to do a little evaluation through the polls. Um, you'll see I'm going to launch right now. Uh, a question will pop up and I apologize to those joining on the phone. Please feel free to send me an email afterwards. The question is, did the workshop expand your knowledge of COVID-19 vaccines, their effectiveness and safety? So once you put in your answer, you hit submit and I'll just give everyone a few seconds to input your information. Your answers are anonymous. And if you're not able to access these questions, please um, email Rebecca and we'll send it to you by email. Great. So I'll just give it five, four, three, two, one. And next question. Do you feel more confident in getting self-advocating for the COVID-19 vaccine? 
And again, these answers are so helpful for us in uh, building and developing further workshops. We really appreciate your feedback. So if you feel like you would like to add more, uh, we welcome emails anytime. We'll put up our contact information at the end. All right, I'm going to give five more seconds and we'll close in five, four, three, two, one. Our third question was the information easy to follow? All right, I'll just give it five, four, three, two, one. Were the resources presented today useful? And I'll just give it five more seconds. Oh, there's a question about what neutral means. So neutral uh, is sort of the middle answer that you don't necessarily agree or disagree. You're kind of in the middle. And I'll just give it five, four, three, two, one. And then this last question is just to help us get to know who has joined us for this session today. All right, I'll just give it, oh, as soon as I said that, it jumped. I'll give it five, four, three, two, one. And don't forget to hit submit. Great. Thank you, and I'll pass it back to you, John. I wanna thank everyone uh, for coming. I wanna thank Tim, the presenter. I wanna thank deaf interpreters and the ASL interpreters, uh, the captionists, um, the SILK team, uh, Rebecca, Rehan, David Myers, uh, Lisa DeBono, um, and especially our executive director who really has been the lead in trying to get vaccines for people with disabilities, um, especially in Toronto. Um, and just one uh, last slide. And that is um, our contact information. If you have any questions, you can email us at silk at silk.ca. And if um, you have any questions for Tim, his contact information is there. His email is t-i-m-i-c-c -C at rogers.com. And once again, I thank everyone. Um, and I will be sending out the PowerPoint, uh, the resources we talked about today. 
um, and also a recording of this presentation within the next 24 to 48 hours. I wanna thank everybody for coming and for your questions. Um, please stay safe and thank you for coming again. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Tim. Take care, guys. It was my pleasure working with you. Thank you, Tim. We can stop recording, man. <laughs>